We've heard a lot about central banking today. We've heard from Hoppe, we've heard from Andrew Dadal. Um, our next speaker is going to apply a little more of that to the Australian context. He's going to be talking about why we should abolish the RBA. <laughs> he's, he's one of the most articulate people on this issue in, in this country. Well, in my opinion. <laughs> Um, he's a director at Leithner & Company, a private investment company based in Brisbane. He, his company adheres strictly to the traditional value approach to investment, pioneered by Benjamin Graham and adapted by Warren Buffett. He was born in Winnipeg, Manitoba, in Canada. He received a first-class honors degree from McGill University, where he was also the university scholar. And he holds master's degrees from Queen's University and the Australian National University. And he completed his PhD at the University uh, of Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland. Chris's most recent book is The Evil Princes of Martin Place, which applies the insights of Ludwig von Mises and other Austrian school economists to the recent global financial crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me in joining Chris. Welcome. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for the, the conference um, organizers uh, for uh, inviting me. I'll talk about a book um, that I um, wrote uh, last year, published at the beginning of this year, called The Evil Princes of Martin Place, um, uh, about the Reserve Bank of Australia. Evil because, as I go through the presentation, it is evil. Uh, princes in the sense that here is a basically a, a group that asserts noblesse oblige. They have the right to do basically as they please. Here are central planners who uh, purport to know something which is beyond the wit uh, of any other individual. And Martin Place because, as you well know, um, that's where they live. Um, I'm very grateful both to Andrew, the previous presentation, and to Professor Hopper's uh, presentation. Why? Because they've done a fair bit of the heavy lifting for me. I'll skip several of my slides. Why? Because they've covered um, uh, what I planned to say already in, um, uh, in very good detail. I'll begin on a shamelessly statist note. For the, sake of, for the sake of the company's financial services license, um, uh, praise be to God, I'm not going to sell you anything. Uh, and the usual disclaimers. Um, uh, exactly that. I'm not giving investment advice that applies. Herewith ends the statism. <laughs> Let me begin um, in a slightly different vein from previous um, uh, presentations. Quite properly, Austrian economics has a very, very uh, impressive, a very big foundation uh, in premises and, um, uh, and logic. This first quote from James Grant, most of whom uh, you'll know, in effect is that Austrian economics works. Given those premises, given uh, the rules of logic, uh, it corresponds to the real world in a way which uh, mainstream uh, economics uh, simply doesn't. Um, I, I mention the quote because um, uh, it, it typifies, I think, or, or um, um, uh, exemplifies what the, the company is trying to do, to apply these insights from Menger, um, Bern Baerbeck, all the way through Rothbard and Professor Hopper uh, to today's financial markets. What we do is look for extremes in markets, says Grant in the Austrian Economics new Newsletter from a bit over a decade ago. Very undervalued or very overvalued. The Austrian school has certainly give us, given us an edge. When you have a valid and reliable theory from which to work, you avoid the problems that comes with stumbling around in the dark over chairs and nightstands, uh, tripping, falling, breaking your leg, etc. At least you can begin to visualize in the dark, which is where we all work. As much as um, uh, Alan Greenspan tried to tell us, as much as Ben Bernanke tries to tell us, he simply does not have a crystal ball into the future. We're all working in the dark. He's deluded enough to think, however, that a Bernanke standard rather than the gold standard provides a more reliable guide um, into the future. The future is always unlit. But with a body of theory, namely the Austrian school, you can anticipate where the structures might lie. You can avoid them and thereby um, avoid uh, the broken legs, etc. To step out of the way every once in a while. I put up this chart simply to illustrate that as a company we've made our fair share of mistakes. Uh, we've been uh, saved, if you like, or we've been prevented from committing even further mistakes uh, by adhering as closely as we can um, uh, to the Austrian school. Uh, the, um, the dark lines, the one towards the top on the right hand side, were basically plotting um, compounded returns over the past, what's that, close to 12 years. We take the, all, um, uh, the Australian Bond Accumulation Index, that's to say, in effect, investment grade bonds uh, with um, uh, uh, come the, uh, uh, the distributions, the All Ordinaries Accumulation Index, um, and our results. 
um, amusingly, I suppose, from my point of view, uh, using the, um, 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 the jargon or the contemporary jargon, we tend to underperform uh, during the boom and we tend to outperform during the bust. That applied in the, the mini bust of the early 2000s and it's applied since 2007. So I suppose uh, the company shareholders ought to pray uh, that the bust continues and ought to you know, thank my lucky stars uh, that we've been reasonably fortunate thus far. Overview. I'll summarize the book, The Evil Princes of Martin Place, the RBA, the GFC, and the threat to your liberty and your prosperity. The key point, summarizing it in a sentence or so, fractional reserve banks, of which we heard from Professor Hopper, FRBs for short, are not just fraudulent, they're inherently bankrupt. Central banks are fractional reserve banks, therefore, fractional, uh, sorry, therefore central banks are not just fraudulent, they too are inherently bankrupt. I've told you nothing that Professor Hopper didn't tell you. I'll add a bit of evidence or uh, embellish the script uh, slightly with some, um, some examples. In a nutshell, the book asks the question, what caused the GFC? What will be the consequences of the actions undertaken by governments to combat it? From an Austrian point of view, this is all pretty boring. We've seen this film before, folks, not just once, not just twice, but multiple times. It's the latest in a long series of economic and financial crises that have punctuated roughly the past 250 or so years. That's to say, uh, during the era when fractional reserve banking uh, began to rear its ugly head. Like its predecessors, we look, the book looks at three previous crises, the Panic of 1907, which conveniently enough erupted almost a century uh, before the GFC, almost exactly a century, the Depression of 1920, 1921. Uh, Stephen Cates mentioned it briefly. Mainstream folks don't like to talk about it. Why? Because virtually the polar opposite response uh, was enacted against the Depression. No one remembers the Depression of 1920, 1921 because it was so damn short. Everyone remembers the Great Depression because it was so damn long. No one remembers, or mainstream people don't remember the, the Depression of 2021 because governments, uh, amazingly, to a greater uh, rather than lesser extent, left well enough alone. And from 1929 to 1946, governments simply could not leave uh, well enough alone. And of course, looking at the GFC from a, uh, an Austrian uh, uh, theoretical point of view and an, an, an Australian um, empirical point of view. Poor policies, in other words, the actions of government, not the market, but the government, legal tender laws, of which we heard from Andrew, fractional reserve banking, of which we heard from Professor Hopper, and central banking, these are the GFC's ultimate causes. As a matter of elementary logic, remove the causes and the consequences uh, will not uh, reappear. Ergo, um, and the RBA. In terms of major findings, uh, for those who've read, and that includes most of you in the Austrian tradition, none of this is particularly new. Fractional reserve banking, by its very definition, breeds inflation, the artificial boom which begets the genuine bust. It rests upon a privileged foundation of legalized constructive fraud, of which we've heard. The central bank aids and abets fractional reserve banks' inflation. It underwrites their privileges, their fraud, basically, and thus exacerbates the cycle of boom and bust. That constructive fraud finances and thereby intensifies the very evils of democracy, devote a full chapter to it, the welfare and the warfare. As much as anything in Europe today is a crisis of welfare, in the United States we're seeing a crisis both of welfare and of warfare. This is all very small print for which I apologize. The critical point, many of you have read it, the article, Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth, written by Mises in 1920, a book length um, uh, elaboration of it called Socialism, published in 1921. What does that have to do with the GFC? Well, things of which I've spoken, what is central banking if it is not socialism? What is central banking if it is not central planning? Walk down the street in Martin Place, elsewhere in Sydney, elsewhere in this country, in America, England, etc., etc. Uh, and as I do, I go to the American Finance uh, Association meetings virtually every year, and there are folks who loudly claim to be free market people, uh, that they are right wing, all the rest of it, the usual rhetoric, I'm a Republican, etc., in, in the American context, and yet they balk at the notion of any criticism, never mind an abolition of a central bank, that they are uh, deeply, deeply, deeply infected with uh, the virus of central planning. Their God is not the God of the carpenter of Nazareth who came to atone uh, for our sins. Their God is Mars, the God of war, who comes to bomb women and children. Um, he who is a central banker is a central planner. 
If socialism fails, if it failed in the Soviet Union and in the ex-Soviet uh, bloc, then please tell me why it is not failing, has been failing as we speak, uh, at the corner of Constitution and 21st uh, in London uh, and here in, um, uh, in Martin Place. In that sense, I'm saying nothing, absolutely nothing new. I'm simply making the linkage. Um, if, in fact, you oppose central planning, then by force of very simple logic, you must also oppose central banking. I'll add a bit of empirical flesh to points that have already been made by Professor Hopper and, um, uh, and by Andrew. And that point is basically this. Since the beginning of the 20th century, central banks have been utterly unable to provide a stable monetary and financial system. They are the authors of economic, financial, monetary chaos. For starters, they've destroyed their respective currency's purchasing power. This is a graph which plots the purchasing power of the Australian currency, be it the pound pre-decimalization and the dollar since 66, 67, and the US dollar. It is a happy coincidence that central banking or something vaguely resembling it through the Commonwealth Bank can be traced to the period just before the First World War in this country and the enactment of the Federal Reserve Act in Washington in December of 1913. It plots purchasing power in Australia and the USA uh, since 1913. By purchasing power, I basically mean uh, how much of a comparable good over time does a unit of currency purchase? How many Granny Smith apples in 1913 versus how many Granny Smith apples today? And the point is that since 1913, the purchasing power of both the US dollar and the Australian dollar and the pound uh, which preceded it has fallen basically by 99%, something close to that, 96, 97, close to 99%. The big culprit, as you'll see, the steepest part of the line during the First World War, a theme of the book, it's explored in, in reasonable detail, is that it is a central bank which finances the war, uh, not just the welfare, but also the warfare. And uh, particularly since the, the formal abrogation of gold, uh, of a gold exchange standard, technically speaking, in the early 1930s, uh, it's been all downhill since then. There was a, uh, the 1920s characterized by a, uh, an increase of purchasing power, but since then it's been virtually relentlessly, relentlessly in one direction, uh, such that um, the uh, currency which bought you 20 Granny Smith apples in 1913 buys you less than one today. There's more than correlation going on here. There's causation going on here, it seems to me. I've simply taken the same data. I'll show you the source of the data in, um, uh, in just a minute. Uh, and I take them back to in the old country, the UK, and in the US, back to 1800. And the basic story here, notice the bifurcation up to roughly the time, well, basically 1913. Uh, during the First World War, obviously, uh, the Bank of England uh, left a formal gold standard. Yes, it uh, undertook. Um, um, open market operations before then, but in a relatively limited way. It did so in a wholehearted way uh, beginning during the First World War. Um, notice that since then, in both countries, the purchasing power of the currency has collapsed. Notice that during the 19th century, and particularly from about 1830 or thereabouts, with one exception in the United States, the purchasing power of the currency didn't just rise, it doubled. So the unit of currency that bought you one Granny Smith apple in 1800 bought you, count them, two apples um, by the turn of the 20th century. That one exception, of course, being uh, in the United States in the War of Northern Aggression from the 1860 to 1865, in which the purchasing power suddenly and dramatically um, collapsed for obvious reasons. The phrase greenback, often used as a, um, um, as a description for the American uh, currency, originated then backed by nothing apart from the sheer force of, um, of evil Abraham Lincoln, a recovery as America returned to something resembling a um, collateralized currency in the 1870s, and then, as I've said already, downhill since then. The British story is even of greater stability from roughly the 1830s, 1840s, until the First World War, uh, and then destruction since then. So I saw there's a causality here. It is not monetary stability which central banks create. It is monetary chaos um, which they create. Um, the evidence, it seems to me, is quite compelling. There are the sources uh, to rub a bit of salt in their wounds. These are official statistics from the RBA, from the US Bureau of Census, and from the Bank of England's inflation calculator. On inflation, it's been covered in great detail, but it's important to make a couple of what are elementary points, but to repeat them uh, as clearly as one can. We've seen central banks don't create inflation, uh, sorry, they don't fight inflation, quite the contrary, they manufacture it, they create it. We've just seen what seems to be strong evidence of exactly that. The shift over the years 
what used to be a commonly understood definition of inflation has left a sinister legacy. I'm drastically simplifying. Pre-Keynes, what was inflation? Was an inflation of the supply of money. In Mises' terms, the creation of fiduciary media. Now it's utterly confused. Uh, the confusion is between the cause, the monetary expansion, the creation of the fiduciary media, and one of its possible consequences, that's to say, the consumer price index. The trouble, of course, is that the consequence of inflation, this is a, a river which can follow various streams. In the 1970s, in Goff's and uh, Malcolm Fraser's day, CPI manifested, or inflation manifested itself uh, at the checkout at Coles and Woolworths. In John Howard's day, it manifested itself in financial markets. Uh, we've had high inflation in Australia. The creation of money has been just as high as in other Western countries. To regard in, uh, Australia as a low inflation country is to indicate one's economic illiteracy. On that point, uh, a Hayek uh, quote from the Wall Street Journal in the late 1970s, uh, important to repeat, if not every day, every morning, once a week or so, should do it. Practically all governments have used their exclusive power to issue money in order to defraud, important point, and plunder the people. Therefore, he asks the editors of the Wall Street Journal, could you please print in front of every issue the headline letters, the simple truth that inflation is made by government and its agents, nobody else can do anything about it. It might do you some good. Uh, the point was made in uh, um, uh, one of uh, Professor Hopper's addresses yesterday. In effect, his idea, my words, uh, if you do it, it's theft. If the Commonwealth government does it, it's called fiscal policy. If you do it, it's counterfeiting. If the RBA does it, it's monetary policy. Uh, if you do it, um, it's genocide and mass murder. If Julia and Kevin do it, uh, it's foreign policy with uh, regrettable collateral damage. There's a fundamental disconnect. Morality, which we can agree for private individuals, is reprehensible for some bizarre reason which is left unstated, is regarded as a virtue by the state. That created a real problem, a plague with no name. This is a quote from Mises, from Human Action. The semantic revolution, which is one of the characteristic features of our day, has also changed the traditional connotations of the terms inflation and deflation. What many people call inflation or deflation is no longer the great increase or decrease in the supply of money, but its inexorable consequences. It's no longer the cause, it's one of its uh, uh, consequences, the general tendency towards a rise or fall in commodity prices, wage rates. This innovation is, no, is by no means harmless, plays an important role in fermenting the popular tendencies towards inflationism. If we don't know what it is that's the cause of our troubles, we're going to have a devil of a time uh, diagnosing it. I mentioned the constructive fraud all the, of, of fractional reserve banking. Because the point's been made, I'll proceed quite quickly. There's a deposit, which is a claim on current goods. A loan is a claim on future, good, future goods. It simply bastardizes the English language to regard them as synonyms for a bank to lend a deposit, a source of the fraud. It seems to me a woman is either pregnant or she's not pregnant. The present is the present and the future is the future. To confuse the two leads to all manner of mischief, namely um, the business cycle. If a bank lends a deposit, then whether the depositor knows it or not, and whether he likes it or not, from the depositor's point of view, he no longer has a deposit. He has a forced loan, which probably was not part of his um, intention. I'll skip and just make one final point re the fraudulence, it seems to me, of fractional reserve banking. I've mentioned the American Finance Association meetings. At those meetings, it's not at all unusual for finance actors. In effect, they are atheists of the Richard Dawkins school. They are incredibly a disproportionate number strident atheists. And yet, without the slightest embarrassment, they assert that something in the secular world can be created out of nothing, which seems to me, to put it extremely mildly, is something that they should think very carefully about. Uh, it doesn't trouble them. Uh, they proceed happily on their way and uh, lead others to what uh, seems to me is disaster. Um, uh, stimulus has been talked about. I'm going to skip over these um, slides. The point's been read quite well. Stimulus is dumb. It doesn't work. It makes things uh, worse. The book's two recommendations are very simple. To repeal, repeal beg your pardon, the Reserve Bank Act 1959 and the Currency Act of 1965. All deposit-taking institutions must conform to traditional legal rules and principles. This means, A, the repeal of the Banking Act, 19, Banking Act um, uh, and related financial legislation, APRA, ASIC can be kicked overboard as well. Maintenance at all times of a deposit-taking, by deposit-taking institution of a 100% reserve, not a fractional reserve. Uh, 
and the punishment of fractional reserve banking as constructive fraud. This is virtually identical to Rothbard's prescription. It is basically identical in an Australian context to uh, Jesus Huerta de Soto's um, uh, prescription of, in his um, uh, dreadnought of a book of, what, three, four years ago, the English language uh, editions. At the heart of these recommendations, if it is not justifiable that if you do it, um, it's theft and the government does it, it's taxation. In other words, if one morality needs to prevail, the consistent uh, enforcement of all contracts by exactly the same standards and without any exceptions. This is a point raised in a dinner time address uh, last night. Fractional reserve, banking, uh, fractional reserve banks lose uh, their state privileged, their state sanctioned privileges. If you want security and entrepreneurial profit, then you're asking for something which is logically simply impossible. If you want a deposit, you have a deposit. There it is, money for safekeeping. If you want entrepreneurial profit, you lend to the bank for a specific period of time. Uh, the two are chalk and cheese. They are fundamentally different. To confuse them leads to endless mischief. And uh, not to put fine a point on it, something that violates uh, elementary rules of logic. Where does this lead us? I'll add uh, a few embellishments slightly from an investment point of view, but basically elaborating something that was on the cutting room floor from the book. The point is this. Several years ago, people would have flatly rejected that big American banks or big European banks could fail. They have done so, so it's no longer particularly controversial. As recently as a year ago, the mainstream uh, hotly disputed, denied, rejected the very notion that uh, a member state of the EU could become insolvent. Now the mainstream tells us, well, is Greece going to be, is it going to be a very messy insolvency or is it somehow going to be a clean insolvency? So um, uh, the insolvency of the nation state is no longer particularly controversial. I had a twist to that, that the bankruptcy of the central bank uh, falls uh, perfectly within that logic. I've put up a balance sheet. A central bank purports to be a bank. Here's a balance sheet. On the left-hand column are its assets. In this instance, we have count them, $1 trillion of one-year government bonds. They have a yield of one quarter of 1%, 25 basis points, 0.25%. $1 trillion of assets. On the liabilities and shareholders' equity side, we have $500 billion, $500 billion of paper currency. This is the stuff in your wallet, stuffed under your mattress uh, that you give to your kids as um, lunch money, etc., etc. We have $150 billion of paper currency notes held as reserves um, um, in banks' vaults. So the, the central bank, in effect, is the, it's not the people's bank, it's the banker's bank. And we have what, in effect, are electronic uh, entries, $250 billion of um, uh, electronic reserves on deposit with the central bank. A balance sheet has to balance. To make it balance, we have $100 billion worth of uh, shareholders' equity. For sharp-minded people, or sharp-eyed um, uh, people among you, this is a greatly simplified representation of the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve uh, circa 2007, pre-quantitative easing. <coughs> Here's another balance sheet. You're Ben Bernanke, and you decide, for reasons best known to you and to presumably no one um, in this room, that you wish to generate economic growth, you wish to stimu stimulate the economy, and you uh, undertake uh, to expand the size of your balance sheet. Now, you've already got a gargantuan portfolio of, um, of short-term uh, treasury paper, yielding all of one quarter of 1%. You can't really push those rates much further lower. So what do you do? You buy longer-term uh, paper, namely 600, count it, $600 billion up, dollars of it, of 10-year government bonds, yielding all of 2%. So your balance sheet notice has inflated to $1.6 trillion. Adjustments made, how did you do it? Well, you have the magic pudding you can write a check upon yourself. Uh, you buy the bonds in the secondary market. That creates uh, uh, fractional bank reserves, which they deposit with you. Here are the, uh, the results thereof, namely that $850 billion uh, commercial bank electronic uh, deposit. And the balance sheet balances at $1.6 trillion. The trouble, though, and quotes, even some quite um, not just quite uh, respected, but in a mainstream sense, among the, uh, the top, within quotation, of the economics profession, uh, recognize this policy has some potentially uh, very severe consequences. Um, Greg Mankiw, Harvard University, here's a quote from just over a year ago, 17th of November 2010. My view is that QE2 is mostly a good idea. 
I say it's a good idea within quotation because, like Ben Bernanke, I'm more worried at the moment about Japanese-style deflation and stagnation than I am about excessive inflation, which demonstrates he hasn't the slightest idea of what deflation is and inflation is. By lowering long-term real interest rates below where they otherwise would be, we've seen uh, at length an explication of that, QE2 should help expand aggregate demand. We had an explanation this morning that that's quite silly. I include the modifier modestly, blah, blah, blah. I don't think these actions are going to have a huge effect. Moreover, I do see some potential downsides. In particular, the Fed is making its portfolio riskier. It, by borrowing short, these are Mancu's words, by borrowing short and investing long, i.e. my words, acting as a hedge fund, the Fed is in some ways becoming a hedge fund of last resort. If future events require higher interest rates, the Fed will end up making losses on its portfolio. On he goes. Remember, this is a tenured academic at Harvard University. Here's a balance sheet post-Q quantitative easing with a post-QE um, rise, uh, post rise of yields. What have I done? I've uh, marked down the $1 trillion uh, worth of very short-term paper from $1 trillion to $993 billion. Why? Because it now yields 1% rather than uh, a quarter of 1%. And I've marked down the $600 billion, a basically uh, combination of a standard sort of a um, uh, discounted cash flow model and looking at the period in the 1980s when rates rose rapidly and roughly at the same sort of a, uh, a magnitude, that $600 billion is shagged down to $355 billion. You can see the trouble, and it's in red. The Fed, technically speaking, is insolvent. Its liabilities exceed its assets. How can this possibly occur? Well, we've just seen how it occurs. The more fiduciary media is created, uh, the purchasing power decrease. At some stage, people will recognize the risk of holding this stuff. They're doing so. They have done so as we speak in Europe. It seems to me the time will come. I wish I knew when. It'll happen in America uh, as well. Does its bankruptcy matter? It seems to be yes and no. The Fed will be bailed out when it becomes bankrupt. My suspicion is because it doesn't market stuff to market, probably it already is insolvent, but because it doesn't, by and large, have to mark um, its assets to market, that's being hidden. Even if it does, it's going to be bailed out, but in a hilariously uh, absurd sort of a way. It's going to issue bonds in the same way it has willy-nilly over the past couple of years. The US Treasury is going to use the proceeds, in effect, to buy shareholders' equity which is then going to be held by the Treasury. So in other words, it's kind of a, a pass the parcel of funny money. It'll fool no one, it seems to me. At some stage, Americans and uh, actors in financial markets will realize, look, this is a Ponzi scheme. This is a chain letter scheme. This is funny money gone completely um, uh, berserk. Uh, second point, uh, William Ford, a former member of the um, uh, Open Markets Committee, said precisely that on uh, CNBC, on Bubble Vision, on, uh, what was it, the 11th of January, uh, of this year, that under given current policies, a rise of rates of not a dramatic amount or an amount that's certainly not outside of uh, the history of the past 20 or 30 years uh, would push the Fed into a state um, of insolvency. But it can hide it because it's largely exempt from that mark to market requirement. A similar sort of a point can be made about the European Central Bank. Quote from the Daily Telegraph, not the Sydney one, but the one in London, quote, the ECB is looking increasingly vulnerable and may face hefty losses as a result of propping up indebted Eurozone countries. A leading think tank has warned. The bank is now 23 to 24 times levered. I forgot to say, as a result of quantitative easing, that first balance sheet, the Fed was leveraged something like 10 times. As a result of the first round of QE in my second balance sheet, it was uh, levered something like 16. The more leverage, uh, sorry, the more QE, the higher the leverage, the less the amount that things have to go wrong before uh, a central bank is tipped into that state of technical insolvency. In the case of the ECB, should its assets fall by 4.23% um, in value, its entire capital base would be wiped out. What do we have to learn from all of this? Again, a quote from Mises. It is not the bust, it is the boom which produces impoverishment. But still more disastrous are its moral ravages. During the boom, the individual is always ready to ascribe his good luck to his own efficiency and to take it as a well-deserved reward for his talent, application, and probity. But reverses of fortune he always charges to other people. He doesn't blame the authorities for having fostered the boom. He reviles them for the, inex uh, the inevitable collapse of the boom. In the opinion of the public, more inflation and more credit expansion are the only remedy against the evils which inflation and credit expansion have brought about. <laughs> 
Back to James Grant, of whom I'm a fan, probably uh, several of you are as well for good reasons. In the boom cycle, people are not interested in a message that says a bust is a necessary part of the business cycle, an inevitable consequence, uh, the bust is an inevitable consequence of the boom. In a false prosperity, which Western countries uh, have endured for the past, well, you count it, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, good economic ideas are marginalized. The ideas of the Austrian school have been marginalized. Uh, my impression is that neither Hayek nor Mises were the second and third most influential economists of the 20th century. Someone like Samuelson, who wrote textbooks, folks like Mankiw, uh, cribbed his textbooks such that literally millions of people have been fed that same uh, pablum. That's an influential, dead set wrong economist, but a very influential one. Says Grant, that's why Austrian ideas should prepare right now, he's writing this in 1996, to offer the best explanation for when the tide turns, as it always does. Who knows, maybe we'll find ways to make the bust intellectually profitable. In time, uh, the Austrian school, Austrian school economics could be seen again as the mainstream theory. It should be. Conclusions, why then abolish the RBA? I'm not holding my breath, by the way. One, they underpin and underwrite fractional reserve banks' privilege foundation of legalized constructive fraud. I skipped over the point, why? Because we heard it in great detail earlier. Point two, they've destroyed the purchasing power of the Australian dollar, pound sterling, US dollar, etc. They ferment the artificial boom that causes the bust. As we speak, they have been, what, for three years, moving heaven and earth, wasting trillions in order, uh, in a vain attempt um, to delay the genuine bust, which it seems to me Europeans are beginning to get the message. Uh, we too, whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not, uh, will get the message before too much longer either. And like other pillars of the welfare warfare state, they're literally bankrupt. Thank you.